Hello and welcome to this tutorial where we'll be talking about BPM and subprocesses. Uh, there are four of them and for each one I'll show how to model them, uh, some patterns to use with them and of course um, how to execute them, how to run an execution. And before that we're going to talk a little bit about the process we'll be using. It's pretty simple but basically I'll be using the different subprocesses as part of, of this very simple process of uh, a document comes in, we do some stage one of important work, we do some processing, we wait for a response, we do some sort of document uh, handling thing and then we send that information and other stuff happens. I'm going to use this as a base and then I'm going to add the subprocesses to that. So we are kicking things off with the most common subprocess. It's the embedded subprocess and uh, it arrives right here. It's got some rules. Uh, the embedded subprocess is right here. It needs to be connected to uh, something and it also needs to have a start event and an end event in it. Um, you can also have neither, but that's the, don't worry about that. Um, so the reasons to use is actually for uh, sort of grabbing a bit of complexity within a process and uh, kind of hiding it. Um, it doesn't actually remove it somewhere else, it doesn't call another process, but rather if we have something like this, let's say this stage one of important work, do some processing, wait for response, review document. Now, if that is not a valuable way to read a process, because your process is quite big, what you can do is you can end up grabbing that stuff and putting it into a subprocess in order to sort of categorize it in one task so that it's really easy for people to read the main model. So what I'm doing here is I'm just taking those tasks and putting them in here and um, there we go and let's just move this over here and add this thing back. Super duper and let's connect. Great. Now this hasn't actually done a trick yet. Uh, it's just, it's still there. It actually makes it kind of less readable. But what you can then do when stuff is in here is you can then convert this to a collapse of process. Boom. So this is going to be called do document stuff. And then all the things around the document handling can be done, done in there. It doesn't um, then uh, sort of pollute the model with a whole bunch of things. And if you wanted to look into it, little button right here where you click and there's the process right here. Now a common pattern that people tend to use with this revolves around the second most common way that a subprocess, an embedded subprocess is useful. That's around scoping mechanisms. So for instance we have a, a document that needs some sort of review here. Uh, let's imagine there's a scenario where two people are asked to review it. Whoever reviews it first uh, cancels the second uh, reviewer, right? Only one of them is needed. Whoever gets to it first is great. The person doesn't need to do anything about it. So that's actually quite hard uh, to um, implement without knowledge of scoping. Now, right now, this sub process has everything in here scoped, which means if we have, let's say, a parallel gateway here, and let's put this here. and we convert these to terminate events. Now terminate events, it's a big misnomer. They do not stop the process. What they do is they stop all the tokens within the scope. So that means it'll arrive in this parallel gateway. Both of these two will be active. Whenever one arrives here, it'll kill the other token and then the process will then come back and continue normally. That's a nice little pattern for you. So let's move on. Okay, so next up is the call activity. Now this is actually confused a lot with the embedded subprocess because they look quite similar. Um, so if I want a call activity, I would need to bring a task out here and I would need to select call activity. And you can see why it might get kind of like confused with a an embedded subprocess, right? Because uh, they look very similar, except one has a very dark line around it and one doesn't. But fundamentally, they are completely different as to why you would use them. While this is used for removing complexity, and it works great for this, and this can also be used for that, the main reason you use um, this call activity is to actually abstract something out of the process into a model of its own. Now, why would you do that? Because you might want to have something, let's say, called multiple times, or you might want something versioned independently. Let's imagine some part of the process changes quite frequently. Well, if you abstract that in a model of its own, well, then it doesn't really matter that um, it changes all the time because you don't need to update the entire model every time you change it. You just need to update the subprocess. Here I'm going to show you the most common use case, which is reusability. So in this example, we now have a new um, gateway, which is an inclusive or here that sometimes we're going to go down here because we need another document. And that means we're going to do this twice. 
Now, this is quite common in quite large models where you get to a point where you're reusing a lot of the logic from before, and that's a good indication you might want um, a call activity. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm actually going to um, create a call activity from one of these. And I'm gonna do that by going into here, and I'm going to create a new model, and it's gonna be called and I'm going to uh, copy my existing model, my call activity model. I'm going to duplicate it. So now I have a copy of it. And now I'm going to call it my um, document doc handle sub process. OK, so now I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of everything else. I don't need any of this Oop. and have a little end event. OK. Great, that's the chunk of um, the process that I really want. So I'll keep that. And it's going to be document handled. Cool. So now I'm going to go back to my other process, my call activity one. And in the place where I had this, this thing here, I'm going to remove all of this. And I'm going to add a task. And I'm going to uh, say, call this a call activity. And now I'll be able to um, uh, use this. And to use it, you just need to click on this thing, link process. And we have here our doc handling sub process. So I'm gonna click on that and then link it. Okay, handle document. Cool, so now in runtime, I now can um, do all sorts of fun stuff there. And I'm gonna do it again over here. Get rid of this, have a task. Now this does do similar stuff to um, the embedded sub process in the sense that it does hide the complexity, but it's no longer in the same model. So that means that it's now independent models that you need to maintain. So it may not be worth the, the, the extra hassle. So let's do that. So now if we run this, we now have, instead of having the same logic in two different places, we actually have the logic in one place. Now, as I move into implementation, things can get even a little more complicated because this is implemented by, we already have our process that's attached to it. We did that in the previous thing. We have our input propagation, right? So it means we're putting in all the variables into it, which is what this button does. And over here, we have output. Now, it's usually not a great idea to take output propagation all, uh, all because that will override variables potentially. So rather you want to specify output variables like doc number, and this will be first doc number because we're doing this twice. So um, there we go. Let's go first doc number. Yeah, there we go. Looks good. So this will then put that output into the process and uh, then you can then play with it later. Um, another really cool thing is that you can change the binding to a specific version. This is what makes this kind of more interesting um, for version management. If you want, you could always have the latest version or you could just have the version that's deployed with it. So whatever version is deployed with this process will always run, or you can have a specific version tag if you want. So this makes it really easy to be able to decide exactly and be dynamic about what kind of processes get called. Okay, and if you really want to be dynamic, this thing here can even be an expression. So you can call a process that is decided in runtime. And there's a really interesting pattern for that. If you have a sub process that let's say process order, right? But it, let's say it depends on a specific region. You can say some process Germany, let's say, and you could have a process order for each country. And in runtime, based on the country this, this um, process is working on, you can call the sub process related to that country in particular. It's a really nice pattern for being able to be dynamic and abstract um, uh, logic. So yeah, let's move on. Okay, now we have two down, two to go, and we're starting off with some pretty cool ones now, which is the ad hoc sub process. This is one of the newest symbols that we have in Commanda in terms of implementation in the engine. And uh, it has a really specific use case designed to fix the very real problem of um, BPMN being a very deterministic um, notation, um, by which I mean that everything that is going to happen needs to be mapped out in advance and it's very hard to do things off the cuff. So in this scenario, let's say that we have our stage, uh, our stage one, our due processing and so on, and um, we don't know what order they might be done in or not at all, 
right? Um, it all depends on someone's choice. We want to give them a choice of what to do. Um, so for that, we can build a subprocess. Let's get rid of start event because ad hoc subprocesses do not require start events. I'm going to select ad hoc subprocess from this. And here's the interesting thing. They don't have subprocess. They don't have start events. They don't have end events. Um, and they just have tasks that you kind of pop in there like this. So, and let's do final review. I'll leave final review where it is for now. Okay. So in this case, we have what we call is a non-deterministic part of our deterministic model, which means that when we start the process, we could do this or this or neither. And if we do this, we have to do this as well or wait for a response before continuing. And this is really powerful because uh, this allows you um, to be able to be way more dynamic than, than you normally would be. And as well as that, it, when combined with AI, which is its primary use case, it allows you to reevaluate the state again and again to, in order to um, choose more options. So in this case, for instance, you might have a um, little task here that's, that's an AI agent. So let's say um, an open AI thing, and it might be decide on what to do. And then after it's it makes some choices about what happens, it can then reassess what happened based on the responses and then do more, do different tasks and stuff. So it's basically allowing you the building blocks to creating an AI agent, which is why they're really, um, why we're sort of focusing on building this now, because it's a real great use case for that. Now, in terms of execution, the way the ad hoc subprocess works is that you need to give it the tasks that are activated. So you see here we have a, a element a collection of elements and um, that would need to be the IDs of the tasks here. So this would then start with a list with the IDs of the task, like task uh, one and task two. And those then will be activated once the process starts. Um, and that's basically it. And then the rest is about decision making about what happens within it. Um, more to come on this feature in terms of execution at the next release. Um, so stay tuned. It is the moment you have been waiting for and I have been looking forward to telling you about. It is the uh, my favorite VPN simple. It is the uh, event uh, subprocess. Um, and it's really, really good. Uh, it's really, really powerful. And it's very, very dynamic as well. Um, so let's look into our current process. We know this from previously, all the same. But now let's think of a fun, funny new use case. And that is that we need the ability to stop this process potentially if another process needs to do a thing and the, an emergency stop. Now, that's an interesting one because there are ways of doing an emergency stop. You might want to um, maybe do something like add a, a task uh, here that waits for a message or something or be able to check after every task to see if they should stop and then cancel but we don't we don't need that not at all we have a sub process we're going to change this to event sub process and now we're going to be able to wait for a specific event type to happen and then stop the process so let's turn this into a message and let's say uh, um, let's say enter reason and then end. And it's going to be a cancel. And this is going to be cancelled. So, or whatever that word. I'm going to leave that there. That's a new word for you to enjoy. Okay, so the way this works is while the process starts running, this is turned on as soon as the process begins. So it's waiting for a message at any point. At some point, the process is chucking along when this message comes in. When this comes in, it cancels all of the tokens in the scope. So they all just get stopped. And then we activate this task, the enter reason task for the cancellation, and we move forward. Now this is a really neat and uh, compact way of being able to catch an event that could happen at any point, but it gets more powerful because while this is really handy for like catching like one-off stops, it can also, as well as being an interrupting task, it can also be a non-interrupting task and a whole bunch of other types of events, like a timer, for instance, after a certain time has expired, let's say send warning. So this could be used for an SLA or something. Um, so let's say it's a send task. So that this would work would be, we start our process, we still have our timer here, but let's say this runs every hour and says, hey, 
this thing is still running, you should check that out. Meanwhile, stuff is still going on and it can happen multiple times. Because it's not interrupting, it can in parallel wait for an event to happen and also trigger it. So this thing can be happening the whole time and meanwhile this thing just gets fired off every now and then sending warnings. But it even gets better than that because there's a use case that I came across a little while ago which I thought was really good, which is um, there was a, an insurance company and they had uh, per client they had lots of different processes running because they maybe were applying for a loan for a boat while also life insurance and whatever else and these things take a while and an interesting thing would happen would be that new information about let's say over the process of them um, uh, applying for their loan they move house and where they live has a let's say a big um, uh, thing to check so what you can do is a non-interrupting signal event uh, can can catch uh, update. So this can be triggered and send an update to all of the processes running uh, that relate to a specific client, right? And then it can update the data with new stuff. So this is pretty cool because that way it can send a blanket email to all the running processes currently in um, uh, and then update data. That's relevant while not affecting the running process which i think is really cool i think that's a really nice use case so you see this might get triggered and update some data this thing then triggers because slas are warning all the time more data comes in because that could happen multiple times and eventually they decide to cancel their application and we enter the reason because they cancelled it and yeah my favorite sub process clearly um, I've heard a symbol altogether. So I hope this really helped um, understand subprocesses. Um, the way this is executed is pretty straightforward. It's just uh, the same way that you would execute any of these symbols. There's nothing else you need to do differently. You just need to add them there, convert it, and then use the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the symbol here. And uh, yeah, go ahead and do it yourself. Link below and uh, have fun. Cheerio. Bye-bye.